Right now, Judgment Day for the men behind the hoax which shut down Boston. They sparked fears of terrorism. The marketing executives promoting Aqua Teen Hunger Force on Cartoon Network. Now the city of Boston wants them to pay. But who else is responsible? What was Turner Broadcasting's role in the whole thing? Live reports from the scene and expert analysis coming up on the live desk. Now, here's Martha. Let's take a listen. I think my dreadlocks are pretty nice and they're going to keep growing for a little while. Uh, and I, maybe they'll reach my knees or something. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting sort of more due to, um, to get a haircut because they, getting my bangs now. I've advised them not to talk about what happened. Um, How do you feel right now? Okay. Um, I feel like my hair is pretty perfect. But altogether, I want to redirect this onto the topic of haircuts in the 70s because I want to educate myself about it a little bit more than I know already. We saw that and it's uh, like in court. Uh, we've seen their appearance what, now. What other haircuts uh, are there? Prosecutors uh, oh, there's the, 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 the 60s. Uh, they not oh, right, right, right the yeah, yeah, I really like the one where the, the hair sort of curls around to the back. Oh, yeah, that's right. They've, so they've hot. taken the case so very hot. seriously. As I said, they've been advised not to speak about the case. Um, have they been advised to act like they're not taking this seriously? We're taking this very seriously. We've already yeah, yeah. How yeah. was it like this been now and there was a yeah. widespread panic um, and disruption to, to commuters yesterday? The police and it cost nearly a million dollars to Boston. Yeah, I really, I really feel like we're not getting the feedback. Yeah, we're we we're not getting the feedback that we need from you guys. If you really want to talk to us, please talk to us about the topic. I'm that, very disappointed. Yeah. What was it like to spend last night in jail? I. That's not a hair question. I'm sorry. What do you disappoint people on apology? That's also not a hair question. Did you feel like you were violating the court today because Turner didn't bring anyone? That's also not a hair question. Mr. Rich, are you embarrassed by your client's behavior? <laughs> My client is a performance artist. And so are we being subject to a performance right now, Mr. Rich? That's your call. Are you afraid that if uh, you go to prison, you'll get your hair cut? Um, that's a very good question. I think, I think the laws in this country are still pretty comfy as to as to that. I think they will, whatever happens, I feel like my hair is safe at the moment. So uh, any other hair questions are definitely welcome. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Do you worry that any sympathy for overreaction that people might have is being uh, wasted right now? Um, and people might be sympathetic thinking the authorities overreacted and you're treating well, this like a joke. Is there any worry that you'll, you'll seriously, waste that what, sympathy? What I'm wondering right now is whether or not the Beatles hairstyle did it actually go into the 70s or was it all stuck in the 60s did it abruptly end and when did the hippie blonde hairstyle come to be and what was with this this mohawk and these huge 80s yeah, hair the, with the all 80s the hair was, gel. I was mean, such an how, overreaction how did, how did that come from the 70s was that some sort of overcompensation from the fact that people were like living fast and loose mr rich you gotta understand your clients aren't generating much sympathy with either the press or the public with their attitude and they may have had it before now yeah. 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 The, the sympathy will come from what really happened um and the and who these people are um, the fact is, it cost the city, according to Boston, over a million dollars to respond to these incidents yesterday. And now we're playing it up with hair questions and jokes. There is a serious element to what happened yesterday. And if you don't like what you're seeing here, why don't you leave the guys alone? Leave the guys alone. Uh, the attorney's standing by. Well, um, it's pretty clear there. You can see very much what it was like. They came out of the court surrounded by the press with the, some of their supporters behind them and talked about hair in the 70s and they refused to talk about anything else. I guess it was a more interesting way to go about a press conference than saying no comment. So Molly, what's likely to be the next part of the process here, you know, in, in terms of any jail time that might be levied at them? What's, what, how are they going to be defended? Well, they're ex they will be coming back to court. We're expecting another court appearance in, in the near future. Just heard President Obama State of the Union. And I'm about to get you, give you the state of Chicago and the state of the urban community. What it did was solidify our expectation, which is very low of this president because of his actions. And the fact that what he did was confirm the lack of involvement, the lack of concern for our community. He doesn't care. He's been, he's been more hurtful to the black race then he has been helpful. Now, for a lot of symbolic reasons, a lot of people accept that, or should I say, most well-to-do blacks or those who think they're better off, they accept that for symbolic reasons. But those of us at the bottom of the, of the ladder, we, we don't accept that. Mr. President, you know, uh, we'd probably be better off 
uh, with you cutting your presidency off right now, just quit. Because if this is what you call helping us, then just stop helping us. This state of union was the same old, same old. A bunch of talk, a bunch of talk and rhetoric to give faith to a dying economy in America. And the reason why our economy is dying, because the president approach as always is to place blame on the corporate world. It's to place blame on, on, on the rich. The blame is equal. It's not the 1% problem. It's not a 99% problem. It is an American problem. And the problem is patronage, nepotism, and cronyism. And, uh, and he turned around and said he's gonna sign an executive order to create, to create uh, uh, minimum wage for, for federal services only. But what about the rest of us who don't have jobs at all? You know, he hasn't addressed that issue. How is he gonna create jobs for us? How can they create jobs for us if they don't bring us into the market? How can they create jobs for us if we're not at the table with them? So the president, to, to look at what this president just did is really a shame because he didn't address any or none of the problems in our community. And that state of the union was not a state of the union. It was a state of the position on how the same old people is gonna to continue to get the same old resources. And I'm talking about these politically connected non-for-profits, the unions who has forced their conversations into the State of the Union. I support a higher wage, but I know with the higher wage come higher prices. I have a graduate degree, and I've been unemployed for four years. With the minimum, with, with, what's gonna happen if you raise the minimum wage? How is it gonna affect me? How am I gonna get a job out of that? Increasing the minimum wage is not gonna put unemployed people to work. It's not gonna fix the economy. Creating industries and businesses in America, which will create jobs, is gonna help our economy rebound. I didn't vote for him because I knew he had done nothing as state senator to then go to become senator and then further became the United States president. He had never done anything for the community. He didn't know the people in the community. All those things you see him in, in, in uh, they talk about in Argyle Garden, he wasn't doing that stuff for real. He once again, he trumped all the problems by talking in a grandiose, general type way, generalizing all the problems, the issues, and making it just real fuzzy and real, you know, real, you know, real warm. We might have well just had a cup of cocoa after he got through, because we didn't get nothing out of this, but another real fuzzy, warm, you know, beautiful statement. And everybody get up that was, that was the powers that be get up and eat, and we all go home hungry again. What Obama did was perpetuate a reality, perpetuate a narrative that is so far removed from what is really happening to us as poor people, as black people, and as young people. But in Chicago, there are no Republicans, no Tea Partiers. This is one of the most democratic cities, but it's the largest city, one of the largest cities where they're starving our, our, our people out. I say to the president that you have been, uh, you've done a, a, um, a grave disservice to us, and, and, and you'd be better just, just go ahead and step down. I mean, uh, you can't turn this around. I mean, it, it's to the point to where, you know, uh, that in which we, new from the beginning because we're from Chicago. It is our job to hold our government accountable to, the to not only the words that they come say out of they mouth, represent, but the funds that they release. It is our job to hold all elected. As you know, I haven't been involved with Robin Hooding and Keene. I've been involved with police accountability activism, both in Concord, Manchester, and in Keene. And uh, it's been very much different environments in each place that I've been. So uh, to give you a little bit of background on what's been going on in Keene, uh, Robin Hooding's how I've been spending a good amount of my time recently for the past year, going out for a few hours a day filling parking meters so that the parking enforcers can't write tickets. It's been very effective. We've gotten sued. We've won the lawsuit against us by the city of Keene. And right now there's an appeal pending to the Supreme Court where um, we believe they've agreed to take the case because they've already submitted us for mandatory mediation 
before a case goes to the uh, Supreme Court. So we're definitely looking forward to that. That'll be in Congress sometime in the next year. Um, Robin Hooding is something that occurred sporadically for the past few years. People would just go out uh, occasionally. Sean Murphy was someone a few years ago who just go out on his lunch breaks and film meters, and that was very effective. Uh, around the turn of last year, myself and James Cleveland were able to um, secure enough time for ourselves and resources for ourselves that we were able to make it a sustained activity every day. Um, so. Uh, Within that, within that sphere of activism, um, I've incorporated a lot of videography. Um, I shoot, I don't know how many dozens of hours. Each week I'm probably uploading maybe five to 10 hours of video. Um, and I'm also incorporating what I'm uploading raw into local television programs. So uh, editing things down for television is an extra step, but it's a way of reaching a much larger audience, people that are not on the internet right now. Um, I'm thinking it's probably an older audience as well. Uh, but it's definitely caused, uh, it's gotten a good amount of feedback from the community, the newspapers written about the show that those free keen people have on Cheshire TV. And uh, so in that sense, uh, it's been pretty effective. Um, one of the challenges here in New Hampshire that uh, and you don't have in other states is when I was traveling around with police accountability tour recently, we were in states where there was only uh, one party consent for recording, which is how most of the United States is. Unfortunately, there's about 14 states, New Hampshire being one of them, where you're supposed to have two party consent for audio recording. That drastically uh, cuts back and puts a chilling effect on a lot of journalism, on a lot of uh, investigative reporting, because you can't go into situations making objective records of things. You're supposed to, I guess, have a good memory and write these things down where these states uh, have laws against recording. Um, so that's something we face here. Uh, some of you may have heard my camera was stolen from me for two months because I was accused of having recorded a meeting with a public official. Here in Concord, there was someone whose whole house got tossed because he was accused of recording a meeting with a public official. Uh, fortunately for me, they didn't enter my home. They waited to snatch me outside of it when I only had a camera on me. Um, but the, the wiretapping laws that currently exist in the state enable the police to go after people who are accused of recording in very ambiguous situations. Unfortunately, out in public, walking around on the sidewalk, um, none of that has ever been called into question. But uh, yeah, other sorts of recording can get you into legal issues. So be careful of that. Um, I'd say document everything, record everything, and uh, be strategic about how you release it. Quick Even question. if you're in public, you're still supposed to tell the cop you're recording him, right? Is that the kind of law, or can you... Do I don't see? believe that. Okay, is that not... Well, are you going to get arrested, though? <laughs> yeah. If they took action on against you in public, there's a good chance you've got uh, a settlement waiting for you at the end of some legal process, so... Um, for what that's worth. Where someone has an expectation of privacy is where that law applies. Another question for you. When they seize a camera, do they convict you of something first before they seize it, or how well, do they seize it? That was part of an investigation. They were investigating lunch wiretapping. Whether or not they actually have probable cause is something we'll find out um, when the lawyer is interested in taking that case forward brings it uh, brings something up civilly. Um, so, uh, yeah, the Robin Hood case is pending appeal to the Supreme Court, and the case of my camera getting stolen, we plan to take action on that. Uh, there is a lawyer interested sometime in the near future. Um, so, uh, the different ways of, of doing media, when you're uploading lots of raw footage, uh, you're expo you have to be very conscious of, obviously, you're walking around, um, you're catching yourself just in normal conversations with all sorts of people. I see why there's a, where there's not too many people that are doing the practice of just uploading everything and uh, putting more of it out there. Um, most of what I'm putting out, of course, isn't getting viewed. It's, it's, most of it's irrelevant. It's just stuff I'm shooting throughout the day, but of course, as the Robin Hood case develops, as different things uh, develop, you may find that that footage is useful in, in the future. Um, in, with the case of the, in the Robin Hood, there was all of these allegations that we were harassing or intimidating or bullying uh, the parking enforcers. And of course, with hundreds of hours of video and none that anyone could point to to say, here's where there's inappropriate behavior going on, that was something that aided our case. The city really had nothing to present as far as physical evidence um, because they didn't have any. Um, in another way, this is very much uh, intellectual property activism. Um, just by going out and recording lots of things, if you're recording sound like music, your stuff will get yanked off YouTube. Um, that's not guaranteed, but if you're catching newer songs just over the radio that's playing in the background, sometimes that stuff will be removed, and I see that as a form of censorship. I mean, yeah, YouTube owns the servers and everything, but um, right now we don't have a free space where you can just put out content unless you, you know, provide your own server space. Uh, but I think that's a great thing to try and combat what, what we could do under the 
guise of Creative Commons. Um, with my television show on Cheshire TV, I have to sign an agreement each week that I'm not violating IP or something. But, I mean, I consider all of that stuff irrelevant. If, if something's out there, it's for you to use. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's an important issue, I think, to push forward, is just that we, you can use something if it's out there. And, yeah, like, people, they may try and take legal action uh, against blogs for posting pictures or... Um, but anything... Uh, I haven't faced any legal issues with that. I mean, I guess there were some people that wanted to report us to Disney because we have a picture of... Disney's cartoon Robin Hood from the 70s on the cards, and uh, I haven't heard of any action from them. I only think that would top the action from the city if we did actually get sued by Disney. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a number of places where the different uh, content I've been putting out is. I try and focus on different YouTube channels, have different types of content. Um, so listed up here, Freeman TV Raw. That's where all of the content that I shoot gets uploaded. Derek J actually created that channel initially to put up his raw content. Um, I believe he has another one now that he's been using more, and like I said, kind of co-opted that one. Uh, but uh, Free Conquer TV, that one's been around a lot longer. That's a little bit more journalism type activism videos. Uh, those ones are a little bit more serious usually. And the Aqua Keen channel is where I'm doing more of the artistic creative content that uh, skirts the IP laws a lot more. And um, yeah, I think uh, in doing, I think it's important that we do more video. I mean, I'm, a lot of us have video cameras or carrying them with us, but how many instances have there been where there have been interactions with police and because we didn't have a charge at that time or didn't have space left on the camera at that time that people have run into issues. So using multiple devices, having multiple devices on you at every time and just having that be a daily habit is something that I think is going to uh, improve a whole lot and expose a lot more that isn't being caught right now. I have a question. Um, if someone is going to film the police, like say I'm by myself and I, I have a cat, I'm just supposed to point the camera at him while he writes me a speeding ticket, or um, you know, how does that work? Well, that's why multiple devices are great to have. For every device you have, it's like having another witness. It's like having it's it's even better than having a witness because witnesses are fallible. The objective record can't be questioned. So that's why I advocate carrying multiple devices. If your cell phone can uh, live stream, that's even better. Um, having things go off-site, of course, is, is way better than having it on-site where it can be destroyed or tampered with. There's newer technologies where the SD cards have Wi-Fi built into them, so even if your camera isn't capable of that, you could have it transmitting somewhere to a separate device. Or These are extra safety measures. Fortunately, I feel like those aren't all that necessary here in New Hampshire. I mean, police brutality isn't... You don't hear about the craziest stories here that you hear about in L.A. or New York or other major cities. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's... Since this is more of a place where people are stepping forward to do more uh, videography and documentation of police activities, we should be uh, advancing the technology and using it more, of course, to our advantage. So yeah, multiple devices are great to have. Um, put a device on your dashboard, put a device on your passenger seat if you get pulled over, and then your hands are free and you can interact as you need to with the officer. Um, anyone have any questions about uh, Things like, well, I guess I go into like archiving lots of video. One thing, if you're uploading lots of video, it's easy to get lost in the mix of like what's in there and what you actually captured. I'm usually not even watching everything I captured most of the time. So labeling it's important. As soon as it's getting uploaded, uh, date the situation, like what it is, usually just Robin Hooding, uh, what happened that day, if anything interesting happened, like interactions with these people, uh, nice person came and gave change or something like that so you can find it if you need to. Um, obviously, because we have done so much videography, there's a lot of content there. If there is, then it sounds like there is a lot of interest in a documentary being made about the subject. So all of this content's already there. I know many of you have seen Derek J's Victimless Crime Spree. That was a great example of Bo, who's a very talented editor, was able to just take a lot of what was already captured and put it together into something that uh, will reach out to a lot more people than would have seen those videos individually. Anyone uh, interested in putting content on the local TV stations here? Because I know Manchester does have one. It would be nice to see that going on. There are some people who have expressed interest in it. I don't see them here right now, but I expect that to start happening. Cool. Yeah, and the way local TV works is you, you literally just submit either a DVD or you go in with a USB drive with your content on it. Usually it needs to be in a certain format and big. And you need to just have an opening and a closing disclaimer usually that says that the producer is responsible for this content, not the station. 
In Cheshire TV, they tell us that they don't even watch it, they don't claim any responsibility for what we put on. <laughs> so, in the late night hours, you can put X-rated content if you want to. Nobody really takes advantage of it, though. <laughs> You're not going to be the first, are you? <laughs> well, actually, uh, our friend Conan has a show called Black Sheep Rising, and it's the only mature content program on Cheshire TV. And usually that's just because of profanity. It's a talk show. But yeah, I'm surprised people aren't taking advantage of that. <laughs> but on the, obviously, if you put it on during the clean hours, you'll get far more viewers. <laughs> what kind of camera should you have? Uh, a cheap video camera that is HD, run you about $200. Um, especially if you get a Sony, those are great in low light conditions, and I find that they start up very quickly. Um, I recently got a DSLR. I'm actually wearing the uh, attachment for a DSLR that you can just plug it into here and almost wear it like a GoPro, which I found very convenient. A lot better than wearing a strap around your neck, which is a big weight on your neck. But um, I didn't bring it with me today, but I use an X grip to mount my camera onto a video camera. And an X grip is basically just a U that has a little tripod screw on the bottom of it. And that's great because you can flip it around and be filming behind yourself over your shoulder and then just move the viewfinder to where you need it. So for $200, you can get yourself a cheap camera, an audio recorder that can run you $40, and that's a great thing to have running if you're out doing any sort of activism. Um, yeah, and cheap DSLRs are now like $250, uh, bucks, so it's not too hard to have a pretty good setup and be able to uh, produce a high-quality product with that. Are you archiving your stuff on uh, like a secret host or secret server so can't easily be removed? Or um, use a commercial site. If by secret server you mean an external hard drive, then sure. <laughs> I'm uploading when I upload everything to YouTube. There's some stuff I haven't downloaded. I've just uploaded it and never got around to it, archiving it. But yeah, I try to archive everything I shoot each day. And by uploading it with the title, with the date in it, it's a way of uh, sorting it automatically so that each file has the date, the activity, you know, the date, Robin Hooding, and then the number of uh, out of the clips that are in there. Yeah. Other than YouTube, um, YouTube seems the most accessible. I guess there's Live Leak. Uh, Live Leak. Blip is also pretty popular, and they don't censor stuff. They won't take it down, I don't think. Um, IP is something that they run into, though, with like Hollywood movies or uh, popular music. Of course, you make it adapt in that way. But yeah, if there's no other uh, questions, uh, if anyone has interest in hearing more about Robin Hooding or trying to do it here, I got some extra cards with me, and also the flyers that we leave on people's windshields when they get a ticket. Um, it would be cool to see that replicated here too, even though there's not, there's only limited meter space here, but, yeah. Oh, and there's a new system in Keene too, I guess. Uh, Manchester may have something similar, or maybe getting it soon, but we still have parking meters, there's limited places that have kiosks, but recently they tried out, or they're trying out a new electronic payment system where the parking enforcers have smartphones, and in a zone, one signs up with an account and a credit card ahead of time, and they can fill their uh, space remotely with their phone. And I guess one of the issues with it is if you're parked in a space where there's no time limit, where you can park for more than two hours, that's not so much of an issue. But now that they have this technology, they're using it to cite people for two hour violations. Um, so if you're parked in one of these zones, you can fill up for two hours, and they'll know that you had been there just two hours, as opposed to if you filled up the meter and they weren't keeping track. So it's a new way for them to ticket people, and they think that it'll say, uh, make the, us double spend, and we will in some instances where it looks like a meter is empty, but we're putting change in it. In Boston, they've always done that by marking your wheel with chalk, and uh, they'll just do their two-hour lap and see if you know, the chalk has a move, and they'll give you the ticket. So. Yeah, there was a short period of time when some Robin Hooders were taking it upon themselves to remove some chalk from uh, tires, remove some graffiti. But we were very nicely presented with a New Hampshire statute that I believe was called like falsifying evidence, and it was uh, pretty much like interfering with a police investigation. And they were like, "This is a felony, just so you know. Like, you're not allowed to do that." I thought it was nice of them not to arrest us. I think that says something about our rapport with the King PD. <laughs> so a lot of this activism is basically waiting for something bad to happen and catch it on camera? <laughs> I think that's what a lot of people expect of when you go out and film the police that you're looking for some sort of brutality and sure in many places across the country you could find it if you just go out with a camera in certain neighborhoods but I mean that's not really the case in Keene that you're likely to just catch something 
uh, strolling around. We've been out so often that they've come to expect that people are filming them. It seems like just about all the time, and it's made an impact. But here in Manchester, of course, that's very different. I was arrested here in Manchester a few years ago with the Chalking 8 arrests. And that was, you know, there were people with cameras out, but they still made bla uh, blatantly illegal arrests just surrounding people up for being in a protest. Uh, so when I'm out in Keene, I'm not expecting something bad to happen that I'm going to catch. I'm more just documenting and um, trying to create something out of that as opposed to expecting something to just be created in front of me. So, I mean, it, it really depends what you're looking for and what you can expect to find in the community you're, you're in at the time. So, if I remember correctly, when you guys chalked the sidewalk, they arrested people and said that was graffiti? Yep. Uh, that, that somehow the chalk was damaging to the sidewalk was the argument that they made, but then at the same time they actually chalked people's private property. <laughs> yes, and it would be illegal for the property owner of the uh, vehicle to remove the chalk as well. They said if somebody came out and removed the chalk from their own car, they could also be charged with the felony. Wow, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, can you talk about that uh, one-party versus two-party consent again? Yeah, one-party consent means that if you're in any situation, you're allowed to record it because you know you're recording it. And if a third party would be recording it, that would be considered wiretapping or someone eavesdropping. So right now, New Hampshire is a two-party consent state, which means that if you're in an instance where someone may believe they have privacy, I guess this would apply mostly to private residences, there's a question as to whether or not it applies to businesses. If somebody is... Uh, if you're recording a private conversation with someone in a particular place um, and they're under the expectation that they may not be recorded, I mean, but what does that mean nowadays? Because it's so easy to be recorded by so many different devices that how could one possibly be, like, is if one's cell phone is being intercepted by a third party and used to record, is that person also guilty of wiretapping? Under the New Hampshire law, you kind of are, because anybody who endeavors to intercept a communication um, is guilty. Right. <laughs> they're operating outside of New Hampshire, so I guess they, they're outside of the jurisdiction. Um, but this also brings into question newer technologies like recording devices or listening devices that are capable of hearing it at long distances. I guess people use these for hunting. Um, so there's totally legitimate purposes, uh, like non-spying on people in their homes and stuff, uh, or just hearing people from afar. It seems interesting that one could just hear a conversation down the street. But right now, that's kind of illegal in New Hampshire. If you're using something that records, I think it's the courts have defined it as like greater than the ear can hear, um, then you'd be doing some sort of wiretapping. I've noticed that with a camera, I, um, my Canon Vixia probably has the best microphone on it of my three video cameras. And that one does not pick up everything that the ear would be able to hear, because I'll hear something in a room and a hearing, and it's just barely not even audible on the, the record. So I wonder if there's like a, a certain curve with the technology where the manufacturers don't want to make microphones that are too good or pick up too much because of the implications with the current wire diamond Doesn't that make hearing aids illegal? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anyone doesn't have anything else, I think that was, I think, in the time. I'm not sure. You're good. Yeah. Um, yeah, check out the videos. Um, some are not related to parking enforcement. You may have seen the Maggie Hassan vodka commercial. That was one of my productions. Pretty proud of how that came out. And yeah, I'd love to see more spoof stuff. And uh, they give us so much stupidness every day, so we might as well take advantage of it and use it. Right on. Thanks.